Dr. Peter White. Peter uh, founded Procter & Gamble Sustainable Development. It says organization here. Does it mean that or does it mean strategy? In 1999? Both. Both. All right. So, and in 2007, created and led Procter & Gamble Sustainability Leadership Council. Peter is actively involved in the work of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and a visiting professor at the Institute of Research and Sustainability at Newcastle University. Um, he's a biologist uh, by training, and Peter has worked at P&G for 20 years in the areas of environmental management, life cycle assessment, and integrated solid waste management. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Peter White, uh, Director of Global Sustainability at Procter & Gamble. while I fiddle with this. That's on? Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you. Um, I was asked to come and, and, and talk about some of the work we've done at P&G. Now, P&G, Procter & Gamble is somewhat different from some of the organizations you're in. But I think there will be some clear parallels in terms of how do you build sustainability into an organization. P&G is a global organization. Uh, we've already heard. We've had, you, you have your colleagues here from Australia, from, from the US, um, and across Europe. So we are talking global here, and we're talking sustainability, and we're talking about how do you build that sustainability into a global organization. Perhaps just a, a couple of words about Procter & Gamble. You may know us, you probably know us by our brands. I can bet that you will have one of our products in your house somewhere. Um, Procter was an Englishman. Gamble was an Irishman. Um, they married two sisters. They set up a company in 1837 in Cincinnati, Ohio, making soap and candles. Um, we've come a long way for, since then. Today we are the biggest um, consumer goods company in the world. Um, we, uh, our products are sold in 180 countries around the world. We've got on-the-ground operations in 80 countries. If you think about P&G in the UK, by coincidence, in the same year that P&G Procter & Gamble set up in Cincinnati, um, a, a person um, called Headley set up a company in Newcastle, again, making soap and candles on the banks of the Tyne. And then when Procter & Gamble came to Europe in the 1930s, they, bought, they acquired Thomas Headley's. And we've had a headquarters in Newcastle and a big presence in the Northeast um, ever since. We, um, we employ around 1,700 uh, people in the Northeast of England, around Newcastle. We used to be the second largest private sector uh, employer in the Northeast, um, behind Northern Rock. Northern Rock, probably a little smaller than it was then, and it's not, and, and it's, it, well actually it's just gone back into the private sector, but it was in the public sector for some time. But you can see we have 127 employees around the world, 75,000 suppliers. So building sustainability into an organization like that um, is quite a, a challenge. Now here's the crib sheet. Okay, you can fall asleep after you've learned this. If you learned nothing else or you remember nothing else from what I say, these are the three things that I would like you to remember. Um, firstly, it's about purpose, purpose, and purpose. Okay. Secondly, having a vision is absolutely vital. Thirdly, we say sustainability is a journey, but sustainable is an adjective. <coughs> and I'll come on and explain why I think that's important. So let's start at the beginning. Purpose, purpose, purpose. It's very easy um, when we talk about sustainability to focus on how we do things, about having less impact, about being more environmentally aware, more responsible. But when we started the sustainability function back in, in P&G back in 1999, uh, we didn't want to get tempted into that. It's very easy to say, okay, we'll just be more sustainable. We'll do things in a more sustainable way without focusing on what is it we actually do. B 
because focusing on the purpose, what you actually do and why you do it, is a key contributor. It can be your biggest contribution to sustainability and often much more important than just minimizing your impacts. Minimizing your impacts can make you a little less bad. But by focusing on what is the good you bring to society, you can actually, cre you can actually create more value and be more good. So purpose is absolutely key. Now your purpose is already said. <clears throat> you teach, you inspire, you create the leaders for tomorrow. You help people, you give them the skills to improve their lives tomorrow. What about a company like P&G? Well, our purpose, our statement of purpose, we, we provide products and services that improve the lives of the world's consumers. That's what we do. We help people have better health, we give them um, hygiene, we give them convenience, cleaning products, health products, beauty products, and the rest. Now, we changed the statement of purpose back in 2007 to explicitly include sustainability. We added this bit now and for generations to come on the air. To make it clear, this is not short-term benefit. Okay, this is a long-term issue. It's about tomorrow as much as today. We are a company. We are a for-profit. And there is a second part to our statement of purpose that says, as a result, i.e., if we improve the world, lives of the world's consumers, as a result, our consumers will reward us with leadership, sales, and growth so that our employees our shareholders, and the communities in which we live and work will prosper. So yes, we are there to make a profit as a result of providing products that improve people's lives. It's as a result. So that's our purpose. Not only that, the company's strategy, the growth strategy for the company, this is the publicly quoted one that's talked to, in, with Wall Street, is related to the purpose. It's called the Purpose Inspired Growth Strategy. And what we've said is we want to touch and improve more consumers' lives in more parts of the world more completely. And we've set a, a target that within the next five years we'll reach an additional, an additional billion consumers around the world. Now we currently reach around four billion consumers around the world out of the seven billion. We've set a target. We want to reach five billion by 2050. And we'll do so sustainably. Okay, now sustainability has to be built into the system. It has to have leadership commitment. This is our CEO, Bob McDonald, who is he's the CEO, but he is also the executive sponsor on sustainability. He owned sustainability before he became CEO. When he became CEO, he was asked, okay, now you're the CEO, who are you going to give sustainability to? And he said, I'm not giving it to anybody, I'm keeping it. It is that central to the business strategy and the business model of PNG that it belongs with the CEO. So he is the executive sponsor um, on sustainability. When he talks about sustainability, he doesn't talk about philanthropy or charity. He says sustainability drives innovation and it builds our results. And it's linked to our purpose of improving people's lives. Now, I don't have to tell a, an audience like this why is sustainability important. But you can see that if you're a company that is currently reaching 4.4 billion people around the world, we want to get to 5 billion by 2015. Eventually, we'd like to reach all 9 billion that will be on the planet by 2050. Sustainability is either going to be a barrier to the growth of the company, or it could be an opportunity for the growth of the company. And clearly, if you ask our CEO which he would prefer, we prefer this to be an opportunity to actually address some of the challenges through our products and through our, ser through our services. Now, p and is not a newcomer in this area. Um, we've been working on um, sustainability, although we didn't use the S word back then for a long time. If you look on the social side, we had a, a code of ethics, a code of regulations back in 1916. We started profit sharing with our employees, I think it was 1896. On the environmental side, we published our first environmental publications around biodegradability of surfactants back in 1956. Um, we've done a fair amount since then. Uh, for example, the standard test for biodegradability, the OECD test for biodegradability, it's known as the STERM test. Bob Sturm worked for PNG. He developed that test um, as part of his work at PNG. It's now the official OECD test. We've worked, we helped found um, CTAC um, the, for environmental toxicology. 
Uh, when I joined the company back in the 90s, I spent a lot of time helping develop the science of life cycle assessment. Um, we were one of the first companies to actually have a corporate sustainable development department, and certainly the first in North America to have a director of um, sustainability back in 1999. Uh, and then um, a year and a half ago, we announced some long-term goals that I'll, I'll talk about shortly. But if you want to put sustainability into a, a, a company like P&G at that scale, you've got to work out all the different touch points of sustainability. Where are your opportunities? Where are your responsibilities? Who are your enablers to actually do it? So back in 2007, um, we put together a new sustainability uh, set of strategies for the company. We had five strategies to deal with the five parts where we really touch. We can... The first has to be our products. People know us by our products <coughs> rather than as a company. So the first was to improve the environmental profile of our products. Second, improve the environmental profile of our operations. Thirdly, improve our social responsibility programs. Our key enablers are our employees. So how do you make sustainability part of everybody's da daily job? And how do you work with outside stakeholders to make sure that we could continue to innovate in a sustainable and responsible way? I'll take you through those quickly, those five areas. The first, the product area, product innovation. Um, you have to take a scientific approach on product innovation, product safety, and environmental quality. And this whole idea of life, taking a life cycle approach, life cycle thing, has to be key to everything we do in the environment. No point making an improvement in one part of the life cycle which causes a problem somewhere else. No good saving water if it uses more energy. So you've got to take a life cycle approach. And the other thing is you have to know where your impacts are. This is my favourite graph, um, and it's just as well I'm showing it inside a university, so you'll understand it instantly. Um, what this is, is some work we did back in 2002 to look at the whole footprint of P&G. All of the different products that we make, so from shampoo, liquid dishwashing, laundry, paper towels, feminine pads, diapers, the snappies down here, and all of the life cycle stages from materials sourcing, our manufacture, packaging, use, and eventual disposal. This is for energy. We've done the same for all the other areas, waste, um, CO2. What you basically see is that dirty, great big red thing in the middle, which shows this is what drives the energy footprint of a company like P&G globally over all our products and all of the life cycles. And that's the fact that people wash their clothes in hot water using our products. That is the biggest contributor. There's another one here, um, which is the amount of energy used to actually make the materials in those laundry products. This is laundry. And there's one here, which is people use hot water to have showers to wash their hair. Okay, but it's this use which has a large impact. If you look at the P&G manufacturer, it's that row along there, relatively small compared to what happens here because you're multiplying it by the number of times your products get used. So for us, if we, were, if we really wanted to make an impact, we'd focus here and here and here and here and here. Okay, but the big one here is people use hot water to wash their clothes. If we can get people to wash their clothes in cold water, give them a product that works in cold water, and then persuade them to wash in cold water, that's where we make the biggest impact. Next thing, once you know where your impacts are, is do you know what your audience is? And uh, you talked earlier about how do you engage with students, how do you get people to change their behaviour? Understanding your audience is absolutely key. We've done a lot of work on this. We pride ourselves on the way we understand consumers around the world. We run focus groups, we run... Um, in-home um, studies, we do all sorts of stuff to understand what is it that consumers want in terms of products and services. What we find that we have data from across the world, and it's, this is not just Europe, US, Canada, it's also similar in Brazil, Indonesia, and other parts. So this is pretty standard across the world. If you look at consumers, there's about 15% of consumers who will buy a product or use a product that's more sustainable because it's more sustainable. You tell them it's green and they will buy it. They will even be prepared to pay a little more or accept a product that doesn't actually quite work so well. But it's a fairly small niche group, about 15% max. There's about 10% at the bottom who really don't care and they're too busy surviving and living to worry about this. 
but you have a huge group in the middle, the sustainable mainstream. If you can give them a product that works as well, if not better, and isn't going to cost them any more, and is more sustainable, they will go for it. So if you're working with the stream, the sustainable mainstream, if you don't ask them to make a trade-off in performance or value, and but give them more sustainable, then they're with you. So, I mean, our strategy has always been a product that works as well, if not better, doesn't cost any more, and is more sustainable, and you will get to, you will have a huge impact. If you go for a green product, you might actually get your 15%. So understand who you're talking to. Okay, so, and then what happens? Okay, so we have, we've tried that. We've developed a whole range of products that are environmentally improved, but perform better, and are no more expensive. We set a, things like tied cold water, um, aerial, um, it's not on that picture, but uh, compact pampers, all sorts of products with less packaging, um, less waste, lower temperature, less water. We set the goal that within five years we develop a market at least uh, $50 billion worth of products that have these attributes. We're four years in and we've got, we've, so far we've done four, 40 billion out of that 50 billion. So we're on course in the next year to reach that 50 billion target. Some examples, the cold water washing one is the easy one. Um, tide cold water, aerial cool clean, aerial XL gel, works at 30, increasingly now works at 15, so cold water. The impact is huge. If you could get everybody in the US to wash in cold water, it would save the energy equivalent of over 4 million households. It would achieve around 4% of their Kyoto commitment at a stroke. 4% of their Kyoto commitment with that just one act. So very simple thing, big impact. In the UK, we've managed to get people, 2% in 2002 were washing at um, 30 degrees. It's now around 32%. Pretty good. Not as good as the Dutch. Now they're up to 52%. So gradually getting people to wash at lower and lower temperatures. Give them the product, then persuade them to move to lower temperature. Not just products for... Um, rich economies, uh, a lot of products designed for emerging economies that have environmental and social benefits. This is a product that cuts in half the amount of water that you need to wash clothes by hand. You only need a single rinse as opposed to buckets and buckets and buckets of rinsing. All right? So the, the benefit is saves a lot of water. That's an environmental benefit. But the social benefit is it's the women and the girls that are fetching the water spending hours every day. If you don't have to carry that water, that's time to spend in education, setting up small business, time with family, etc., etc., etc. So again, social and environmental benefits from product innovation. And we don't do this alone. We've set up an open innovation program called Connect and Development. It's Connect and Develop. This has been going 10 years. We try to find good ideas in universities and other places where we can actually partner to bring that research into P&G to include in our products. Uh, we've just announced recently a big uh, partnership with Durham University here in the UK. We have strategic partnerships with a range of universities around the world where we take you know, research projects, work on them together, bring them in either as product or process improvements. Um, one that we worked in the UK with RAP, the Waste and Resources Action Programme, was to develop software so that you can take plastic out of bottles. All right? If you model a bottle, a plastic bottle, you can work out where the stresses are and where the stresses aren't during transport, use, and all the rest. You can then take the plastic out where there are no stresses, and you leave it in where there are stresses. And that simple act of uh, modeling the bottle, you can design bottles with 14% less plastic on all bottles across your whole product range. So that's a huge saving in terms of um, uh, plastic. Um, it's been used in China, it's used all over the place to actually reduce the amount of materials that you need to actually get the product to the consumer. Second area is the operations. Okay, the product is the real place we focus because that's where we have the big impact. Operations, obviously, we improve the efficiency of what we do. And that's not only from manufacturing, it's in the product logistics and also in the supply, the supply chain. We said that we would take 20% out per unit of production of CO2 energy, water and waste over a five-year period. We're four years in. Um, and in that period, we've knocked 
CO2 down 12%, energy is down 16%, 22% less water, and a massive 57% less waste per unit of production. So we've halved the amount of waste per unit of production. I'll just give you some examples of how we've done that. The facilities design, I know facilities is something that's close to your heart here um, on campus. We've made a commitment that all of our new facilities will be LEED certified, the LEED uh, standard um, out of the US. So these are plants in China, Brazil, wherever, will all be uh, LEED certified, and we have a checklist for facilities designed for new product, for new facilities. Third area was the social responsibility. We can improve lives through our products, but also through the programs and the communities where we operate. We have a few um, global programs under the umbrella of Live, Learn and Thrive. These are aimed at children aged 0 to 13. Live programs are around education. Learn programs, don't have to tell you guys. Um, it's uh, the education and um, Thrive are around programs that provide empowerment and skills for life. So a range of different programs around the world. One that's particularly close to my heart is this program. This is a product. It's a little sachet about the size of a tea bag that was invented in Newcastle, here in the UK. Um, you take that little sachet, you put it in a bucket of filthy water and stir it, and you end up with clean, clear, pure water that passes all WHO drinking water tests. That product is now has been used in 60 countries around the world. We run it as a not-for-profit. Um, we provide it at cost, or we donate it. Um, we've so far um, delivered, since 2007, we've delivered around 3 billion litres of water, working with about 120 different partners around the world. So whenever there's a humanitarian disaster, tsunami, flood, what, you name it, this product is shipped by UNICEF or CARE or the Red Cross or whoever to the area and so that they can have clean, safe drinking water. Not only that, but some of our programs link, are linked to our products. So um, this is uh, Pampers has linked up with UNICEF over many years to help eliminate neonatal tetanus, not just reduce it, eliminate it. Um, when someone buys a pack of Pampers, we basically donate a vaccine through UNICEF to help protect uh, mothers and babies. So far, we've delivered around 300 million vaccines to protect 100 million women and their babies. The plan is, that, or the goal is, with UNICEF to eliminate neonatal tetanus by 2015, which is a big target in a short period of time, but we think um, we're on our way to doing that. Okay, the um, fourth strategy, the enabling strategy, was around employees. You can't do all of this if you haven't got your employees on side. Uh, if you want to work with employees, there are three different areas that you need to work on. Firstly, is awareness. Do they know what you're doing? Do they know what sustainability is? That's relatively straightforward. Second is, can you engage them in programs? Can you get them to do the office recycling, turn the lights off and the water and all the rest of the stuff? But the third one is the difficult one. And that's, so what does it mean for my job? It's all very well doing the officey bit. But okay, so you're in R&D. What, what does sustainability mean for R&D? Well, generally it means inventing new, more sustainable products, new, more sustainable processes. But what does it mean if you're in finance? Okay, what does it mean if you're in marketing? What does it mean if you're in HR, human resources? So working out what does sustainability mean for my job is a real challenge. And we're working on it, but it's not something we've, you know, we've got across the board. Because in certain fa functions, you know, exactly how you do it. If you're in the sales organization, so what is it you have to do in the sales organization? Perhaps partnering with retailers on sustainability initiatives. Lots of opportunities here, but you have to really think about what does it mean for my job? The employee engagement piece, I mean, there's lots of stuff going on, and you, you will have similar things on campus. We have, you know, zero waste teams. We have, um, we have a network called the Sustainability Ambassadors Network, where people who have a, a passion for sustainability get together and swap ideas around the world so that we can share good ideas, we can support each other on site events. Every year on Earth Day, we have site events at all of our um, plants and facilities, so everybody is aware of what's going on. And then the stakeholder piece, we have to work with outside organisations because we don't have all the good ideas. Um, we know that um, 
our partners often um, are essential uh, as part of our programs. So we have, uh, you've mentioned UNICEF, a whole range, PSI, Population Services International, is an organization that helps distribute that sachet for clean drinking water. Um, a range of different external ones on the social side and also on the environmental side. Uh, we have a global partnership with the World Wildlife Fund. Um, we have uh, the Consumer Goods Forum is an organization that links together all the major manufacturers and the retailers. So the P&Gs, the Unilevers, the Tesco's, the Walmarts, the Safeways, all of these organizations coming together to work on sustainability. Now, that organization has just uh, made a commitment to help end deforestation by 2020, which again is a huge commitment, which we will do through our work in our supply chains for palm oil, pulp, um, soy, and, and other commodities. And the other part is um, suppliers. Um, we have, I said, 75,000 suppliers. We've just introduced a supplier scorecard so that we get our suppliers to report to us on their improvements, because if we have an improvement in our supply chain, it's an improvement in the, in the life cycle of our products. Okay, that was the first one. Purpose, purpose, and purpose. Second one. Vision. Vision is absolutely vital. Uh, as someone said, um, action without vision is merely passing the time. Okay? If you don't have a vision of where you want to go to. Now, we had um, a sustainability strategy that we set in 2007. We had environmental strategies before that. But we didn't have a vision. And we knew that sustainability was either going to be a barrier or an opportunity. So, <coughs> Uh, two years ago, we took the step of setting out the long-term sustainability vision. Now, with sustainability, to me, um, needs a long-term view. If you have a five-year, we had five-year goals on sustainability and strategies. Five years on sustainability is like walking down a country road in the dark with a flashlight, a torch. You've got just about enough light to see where the potholes are so you don't trip up. But you don't know if you are on the right road, and you don't know if you're going in the right direction. So what we wanted to set was, what's the lighthouse at the end of the road? Where is it we want to head to long term as a, if you were going to be a sustainable company? And we came up with this vision of a sustainable company um, that we wanted to aspire to. We said we want to improve the lives of the world's consumers. We want to get to all the consumers on the planet but we want to use 100% all materials in our products and um, uh, packaging will come from renewable materials, sustainably sourced, or from recycled materials. Okay? We would make our products in plants where the water that comes out is as clean as, if not cleaner, than the water that goes in, where there is zero manufacturing waste going to landfill, where the plants run on 100% renewable energy, We'll make products that help consumers reduce their impacts, and long term, we're going to work towards zero consumer waste from our products going into landfills. All right? Now, that's quite a vision. All right? um, and if you can do that, then you are improving lives with as little environmental impact as possible. Now, that's the vision. It doesn't have a date on it. It's a vision. It's the lighthouse at the end of the road. So what we did was then we set some specific goals for products and operations that will see how close we are to that vision by 2020. So we've got goals for 2020. Um, we said we want to go to 100% renewable materials, 25% by 2020. We want to get people to wash in cold water, 70% of all machine loads by uh, 2020 in cold water. Less packaging and ways to stop landfilling of, of our products and some things that we are already trying. On renewable materials, we've already introduced sugar cane derived plastic. So this is plastic that comes from, derived from sugar cane, sugar to ethanol, ethanol to ethylene, ethylene to polyethylene, and then you make the bottle out of it. So it's renewable, okay? It reduces CO2 over the life cycle by 170%. And I'll tell you afterwards why it's how you get to 170%, but if anyone's interested, I can tell you later. We set some goals for operations in terms of renewable energy, manufacturing waste, virtually eliminated, less trucks 
um, less truck transportation. Some examples, wind turbines um, in our plant in um, the Netherlands, reducing manufacturing waste. 96% of everything that goes into a PNG plant comes out as packed product. Half of what's left is recycled. And we found some interesting ways to use that waste and turn it back into a product. Um, for example, in Mechelen in Belgium, where we make Pringles, the old oil was waste. We used to have to dispose of it. Uh, we now sell that to someone to make it into biodiesel. Okay, so lots of examples here of what we've managed. Uh, and ditto on trucks. If we can get things off trucks and onto rivers, onto boats, um, onto trains, we can cut CO2 by around 60%. So we've got a, a range of different routes around the world where we're now putting things off, train, off trucks, onto trains, or onto boats. Last point, because I've, I've only got one minute left, I've heard. Sustainable is an adjective. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, we always talk about sustainability um, being a journey, but sustainable is really an adjective, and it's the word that comes after it that's just as important. And this comes back, I think, to the, to the whole thing about purpose. What is it we are trying to do more sustainably? We can have, if you read, this whole thing started with sustainable development. It's development that is sustainable. For us, it's sustainable business. How do you make sure that our business is sustainable economically and socially and environmentally? Can we get to sustainable consumption? That's a real challenge. That's one of the biggest challenges we face. But we still need to run our plants through sustainable engineering. We're trying to get our consumers to, do, to be more sustainable, sustainable lifestyles. And your role is how do you make education sustainable? So we're talking again, it's not just about how we do it, it's also about what we do, okay? We try to make, we try to improve the lives of the world's consumers. We provide social benefit, we provide economic benefit, we try and do it sustainably in terms of less environmental impact. And I think from what I've heard of your agenda, it's what gets taught, how it gets taught, where it gets on courses, People often come to me and say, you know, do I do sustainability for PNG? No. Um, I used to do sustainability for PNG. My job now is the conductor of the orchestra. I don't do any of the sustainability. We have people in finance. We have people in R&D. We have people in the business units who do sustainability. And our job now is really just to coordinate and ensure collaboration. We say we, we write the music and we make sure they all play the same tune, but we don't play any of the instruments. So sustainable is an adjective. It's what is sustainable that's key. So the three things I wanted you to remember, purpose, purpose, purpose. Vision is vital. Sustainable is an adjective. And I suppose the fourth thing is it's about what we do and how we do it. It's not either or. It's both. Um, my marketing colleagues tell me that you have to tell people th something six times before they'll remember it. Mm -hmm. You've seen that list six times, so I hope you'll remember it. So thank you very much.